Hey everybody, my name is Jared and I am a Master Mason in the state of Mississippi in the United States of America. And this is our first ever live broadcast. We've got a particular subject matter we want to talk about, but more importantly, we also have a time limit we've set to ourselves. So for the next 30 minutes, Jason, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Jared. Hey, everybody. My name is Jason Richards. I am a past master of Acacia Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia. I'm also a member of an academic lodge in DC, uh, Colonial Lodge, the Colonial Lodge number 1821. And I'm a host of the Masonic podcast, the Masonic Roundtable. Awesome. Well, Jason, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to come on tonight. I was concerned even when I first reached out to you because I know you're uh, a new dad, got a little one there, and that you've got a lot of other things to be worried about than being a guest on someone else's podcast. So uh, I really appreciate you doing that. And the reason that I wanted to have you on is because I know how much Masonic education means to you. And I thought that this would be uh, a good way to start talking to brethren about ways to try to bring Masonic education back into our lodges. Uh, and hopefully not education that is solely focused on how to do the ritual. So uh, to get into this conversation, I want to show everybody something. So since I haven't done this in a while, give me a second while I learn technology that doesn't want to work with me. Let's see here. I think that's like all technology, Jared. It is. It probably <laughs> is. All right. So let's see here. Let me share this. So this is the uh, event calendar for the Grand Lodge in Mississippi, and I'm sure I've mentioned it a time or two before, but as it happens, I am the Internet Committee Chairman for the state of Mississippi and the webmaster. So anything wrong with the website, that's my fault. And this is the event calendar we use. Now we do one thing a little bit different than some jurisdictions. We forbid the use of the event calendar for stated um, communications. We, we don't need all that clutter on there. If you don't know when your own lodge meets, sorry. But what we do have on here are uh, different degrees. So you can come around here and you can see the different degrees that are going on, but that's all that's on here. The only kind of event you're really gonna find is degree work. Uh, and that kind of concerned me. And if you look over here at the Masonic Roundtables website, uh, they have this excellent list here of speaking engagements. And it goes all the way to October 2019, already has some events planned out. And we can uh, scroll down the list chronologically here and see a couple events that have passed recently and see some that are still coming up in the very near future. And here in Mississippi, there's just nothing like that. Um, so what I really am wanting to talk to you, Jason, is about uh, maybe some of the cultural differences between how Masonic education is handled. Uh, here in the state of Mississippi, um, we do have a uh, a research lodge, and they do try to get around to the different um, areas of the state of Mississippi and provide some form of Masonic education. But at the end of the day, they are a regular lodge, meaning they there's no, the only thing special about them uh, in terms of being a lodge is that they have a special right to only meet four times per year, whereas every other regular lodge has to meet uh, every single month. So they can confer degrees and, and all those kind of things that you might expect. But actually having education inside of the lodge is usually limited to the master of the lodge either making an effort out of it or an individual brother standing up and saying, hey, can I try? So let's kind of try to transition that over into a more formal education and talk about how did you get started with actually being invited into a lodge to speak, whether it was a lodge you were a member of or a, a different lodge in the area. And did it ever evolve into something where you reached out to lodges or maybe it started that way where you said, hey, I'm here, I'd like to talk about this. And then people started calling you. So how does that get started, Jason? So uh, right before we get to that, you, you said two things that I want to key in on, you know, Masonic education seems to get started from 
the master making an effort or a brother saying, hey, I'm here, I want to do this. Both of those are exactly how Masonic education gets started. And both of those are the reason why I think um, at least my speaking schedule is is so full. Um, you know, you'll you'll look at those events on the Masonic Roundtable page, and that's uh, you know those are because either a master or a lodge education officer actually reached out to me and and my brethren and said, "Hey, we'd like you to come speak." So um, I got started uh, with Masonic education really because um, I was interested in it. And some of the masters in my district took notice. So I was, I did a lot of Masonic education for John Ruark when he was the master of the Patriot Lodge, number 1957. That was about when, it was about around when the Masonic Roundtable first got started. So John had an idea. So he, he of course, is, is very passionate about Masonic education as well. He had an idea to say, okay, let's have a little bit of Masonic education for each meeting in addition to a big speaker. And the little bit of Masonic education he wanted was he wanted like a three to five or seven minute talk on each of the liberal arts and sciences. And he said, okay, Jason, as my lodge musician, I know it's not your job, but I'd really like you to present a little something at, uh, at each meeting. And so I got started um, doing Masonic education just by coming up with a little three-minute ditty on rhetoric and logic and music and astronomy and presenting that uh, at a stated meeting. Um, as a Masonic roundtable uh, took off more and more, and I started to get into um, body research-oriented bodies like the Allied Masonic Degrees, which require papers and programs, I started to do a lot more research for a lot longer presentations. And, um, you know, it's it's been a combination of me telling folks, you know, every chance I get on the Masonic Roundtable, hey, look, I'll, I'll come to your lodge for free. If you are interested in Masonic education and furthering Masonic education, like I, I will do everything in my power to to help spread light to your brethren because I think you know Masonry is just so rich as far as educational opportunities are concerned. I think you're doing a disservice to your brethren if you just read the minutes, study the ritual, and get out. Interestingly enough, the Grand Lodge of Virginia specifically draws a line between what is Masonic education and what is studying the ritual. They are two separate and distinct pieces of the Masonic experience. And that's something I really like about how Virginia does things uh, because we need both. We need ritual proficiency because that is how we, we train the technical skill sets of our new brethren. That is their initiatic experience, their introduction to Freemasonry. And then the Masonic education piece of that is just the icing on the cake. And that's, so the, the Masonic ritual gets folks into the fraternity. Masonic education keeps them in the fraternity. So let's try to knock something out here uh, as quick as we can, because I think it's gonna be a question some people have, if not individually, then for their lodge in general. I, I could see how here in Mississippi, if somebody got up in a lodge and said, hey, I think it'd be a good idea, let's invite a speaker to come over, that the first concern somebody's going to have, or at least the concern will be raised before the discussion is over is, well, we ain't got any kind of money to offer a speaker to get them to, to come here. But as you just said, you would be willing to go to a lodge and, and speak for free. So what can you tell me about that being the norm? Is that your personal preference? Do most speakers travel locally at least for free or what could a lodge expect if it reached out to somebody to say we want you to be a speaker would should they expect to have to provide travel uh, reimbursement to provide a speaking fee or what so um for me that's that's personal preference and i you know i i put an asterisk up there when when i say i'll, I'll come and speak at your lodge for free i don't charge any sort of speaking fee uh however my uh my wife 
who I love very dearly, lets me lets me go on these adventures, provided that uh, that my travel arrangements are taken care of, and I'm not actually you know emptying the family kitty to go to go speak at lodges. So I tell people if you're you know if if you're within the DC metro area and you want me to to come speak, I'll, I'm happy to to come and just you know hang out with you guys for the night and, and come speak. But if it's if it's an instance like uh, when I was up in Pennsylvania two weekends ago. Um, speaking actually with the Masonic Light podcast, brethren, um, I say, hey, you know, it's it's a day trip, but if you could just, you know, give me a little bit for gas, that'd be great. Uh, for longer trips where I'd have to stay the night, I'd say, hey, at least, you know, please, please pay for my travel and, you know, put me up in a, in a bed somewhere. Uh, and that's going to that's going to vary from speaker to speaker. Uh, however, what I what I do tell brethren is um and I have done this, and so have uh, Robert and John. We will come and we will Skype a presentation into your lodge. So if your lodge is equipped with a broadband internet and you know a projector or a smart TV or something like that, um, John and Robert have both Skyped into Taiwan, a lodge in Taiwan, to give uh, Masonic educational programs over Skype. And that's that's one of those areas where I'm like, as long as we have the technology set up, you know, you give me a time, as long as it works with my schedule, I'll come and present a Masonic educational program and we're all good. And so that's that's a way that you can really get around the the aspect of of money and paying money for speakers because I know there are a lot of Masons who are against that. Um, they think uh, Masonic education is is a right, is an inherent right, and you shouldn't have to pay money for an inherent right and benefit of of being a Freemason. There's a little bit of a, a line that gets drawn between like Masonic merchandise, which will say "shut up and take my money" to, and then Masonic education, which where where we're very very hes hesitant to to pay money for that. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what that is, but if you're a lodge that doesn't have a lot of money you don't have to try to get speakers from all over the country or all over the world. You can, you can try to find them in your own backyard, your own, your own lodge brethren. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of places you can go to, to get Masonic education and Masonic education is best when it's a grassroots effort. So again, I don't want to stick on money for too long, but I do have a follow-up thought to, to add to that. Sure. Um, uh, it sounds like we generally have the same kind of thought here, how it's perplexing that we would shut up and take my money. And and I talked to this about to our grand treasurer, actually, at, at our grand lodge. And, and we were speaking about some things. And I said, isn't it interesting how many people made sure they had 100 bucks cold hard cash in their pocket to come here and buy stuff off these tables? But if you told them that their lodge dues were going up by $100 per year, they'd freak out. <laughs> and it's the perspective behind it's kind of interesting. Or even to take it to another level. Sure, Masonic education is free. Go to a library, go to your Grand Lodge, look online, and you can research anything you want for free. But if you want somebody with a little more understanding to teach you, like going to a university, you pay. And, uh, and I think that that's, to me, that's where my mindset is about the whole thing anyway. But if you have somebody who says, hey, you know what, I'd, I'd be willing to teach this class to you for free if you can uh, pay the ga gas or have a meal that night at large so I don't have to buy one, then, then hey, great, take full advantage of that opportunity and, and bring the person in that's willing to do that. Uh, so the next question I have for you is, what do you speak about? And then if there is more to that, what do you see other people speaking about? So in my mind, I, I imagine that maybe I go to a Jason Richards for a particular type of instruction if I want to bring in a speaker. But if I want a, a different set of topics talked about, maybe an RJ, uh, a, a Rob Johnson is better, or maybe a John Ruark is better, or maybe a Mike, uh, the intern is better. So do you generally see that each speaker has their own particular field of interest that they teach? teach about or do each of you uh, and the other speakers that I haven't mentioned generally have a, a wide scope of things that they could offer a lodge? So when you go to the university, you don't typically see historians teaching physics. So it's very, you know, I very selfishly 
keep my programs along the the vein of my scholastic interests, uh, which typically revolve around history. Although I was invited to a lodge last year to do a uh, a table lodge program on um, astronomy. So what I did was I talked about the history of astronomy and uh, and pagan sun worshipers, and so that even then I said this is this is what happens when you bring a historian in to talk about science. And I'll talk about the history behind it, but not the science itself. And so yeah, with with each of us on the Masonic Roundtable, you're going to get a different flavor of Masonic education. For me, I am all about history. I, I was a history major in college, uh, and I, I absolutely love piecing together the jigsaw puzzle, the warped jigsaw puzzle that is um, historical knowledge. So I have three programs that, that I do. I do a, um, a history of the Noahite influences to the Masonic third degree, because the, uh, the legend of the third degree was, was not always that story. There were, there were a couple different legends that were all popping up the same time around the 1720s. I also do uh, the program that I'm doing a lot this year is the transition theory of Masonic origins. And what it is, is it traces the evolution of Freemasonry from the operative stonemasons guilds to the speculative fraternity that we have today in Scotland. So I go through about 800 years of Scottish history in 40 minutes. Uh, and I keep people awake, supposedly, while, while doing this. And then I also look at the history of Freemasonry in Russia and how the hi the history of Freemasonry is innately tied to the Russian uh, population's perceptions of Western culture. Um, and those are those are the three main programs that that I have that I'm doing right now. Um, I kind of abide by John Ruark's philosophy, where he he says, "Okay, I want to do one big Masonic." presentation a year, like one new one, research it and get to the point where I can give it. So this year I think is the, the going to be the Russian Freemasonry one because I've given it uh, in fits and starts here. And then we did an episode on the Masonic Roundtable of it. But if you're looking for something that's deeply esoteric uh, and, uh, you know, especially something with, with Royal Arch esotericism and philosophy, you want to go to John Ruark. He is incredible with all things esoteric. Uh, if you want to blend the two, esoterics, history, uh, with a little bit of um, Judaism and etymological discussions thrown in, you go to Robert Johnson because he's got an amazing, amazing, amazing um, talk on the Tetragrammaton and, and the word. If you are interested in self-improvement and actually operationalizing the teach the teachings of Freemasonry and figuring out how to actually live yourself as a Mason every single day, you want to go to Juan Sepulveda for that. And then Mike Hambrecht is really good in um, just talking about Masonic education and how to actually get out there and start teaching in your lodges. So let's tie that back into what we first started talking about. When when John first said, hey, I want you to teach something in the lodge, did you stick to what you were comfortable with and teach about history things? Or did you stick to more ritual things because that's what the people in the lodge were more comfortable with? Or what were your original topics about? So my, well, the, so the first big presentation I ever gave was on, on Freemasonry was the Noahite program that I did for the Pennsylvania Academy of Masonic Knowledge. That was my first major Masonic speaking event, which was, uh, which reflecting on that now is like, wow, okay. <laughs> Starting off with a bang. But for my lodges and John's lodge, um, they were just small programs. So when you're, when you're doing a small program, that's like three, five, seven minutes long, you can really talk about anything because you can only go, you know, an inch deep. Um, so you can do overview topics really, really easily. But when you start getting into 20, 30, even hour long uh, programs, that's when you really have to buckle down to your homework. And, you know, masonry is a labor of love for, for most all of us. So this is an extracurricular activity. I'm not going to study it unless I'm actually interested in it. And that's, that's where those lanes in the road come in. 
So just to kind of bring those two things back together for the listeners, uh, and then we've got about 10 minutes to wrap this up. The best advice is maybe the master of the lodge is already looking for an education program or has one in place that you can offer yourself up to, or you can go to the master of the lodge and say, hey, I'd be interested in speaking about historical things or practical application things or esoteric things uh, or general education topics. And then let the master bring you into it when, when he's ready to. But the key here being not to try to step out and as you put it, don't be a history teacher and try to speak about physics. Stick to what you're comfortable with and let that be an offering and be prepared that if somebody says, hey, we know you're a speaker, we want you to come speak about all the esoteric meanings of the Delta, but you don't do esoteric symbolism, you do history, be comfortable in saying, sorry, brother, I'd love to, that's not really my forte. Let me see if I can find someone else that'll speak to that. Does that seem like a reasonable summary absolutely masonic education should be fun and it should be fun for the brethren who are receiving it but it, it should also be really fun for the brother giving it um and if it's you know a, kind of the mantra in masonry at least as far as i'm concerned is if, if it's not fun then then why are you doing it because none of us uh more or less none of us are getting paid to do this so we might as well make it you know fun and engaging and worth our time um when you start giving programs and lodges, it doesn't have to be your own research. You know, you've got the uh, MSA short talk bulletins. I've got um, an awesome little book called uh, Three, Five, and Seven Minute Talks on Freemasonry. Like, if, if you're interested in just injecting Masonic education into your lodge or a lodge in your district, talk to the master and if you end up reading a Midnight Freemasons article or something along those lines or talking about your favorite Masonic symbol and what it means to you, that's that's fantastic. And that's an amazing place to start. The fact of the matter is, I think a lot of times Masonic education doesn't happen because people don't think they have anything meaningful to contribute. And, and that's, you know, that does everybody a disservice when you don't even try. Well, I certainly think that there's a, a level of hesitation, uh, even if somebody um, had to do research at the high school level, maybe that was 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago for them, and they're not comfortable looking into sources and compiling an essay and standing up in front of the class and speaking anymore, or uh, whatever the case may be, it just may not be uh, something that they, they have an interest in, but they haven't had to do it in so long that they don't know how to get past that initial hurdle. And uh, I don't know about you, Jason, but for me personally, um, I when it comes to something like that, I'm an outgoing person. There's plenty of other situations that I'm not an outgoing person on. But if I see that there's a need and nobody else is doing it, well, heck, that's how I got started doing the webmaster uh, for the for the Grand Lodge. Uh, the darn Grand Master got up there and said, "Hey, we're looking for a webmaster," and I, like a brand new budding master mason, I I can do that. I can help. <laughs> Pick <Yeah>. me. <laughs> I've been doing it ever since, right? Um, but that's how I got onto the public relations committee of the Grand Lodge of Virginia. By the way, there you go. I uh, want to help. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's kind of if we if we can relate it back to something people are probably more familiar with and being the ritual work and you have people who will never get up and actually perform the ceremony during a live degree, but they'll happily sit on the sideline during practice and tell you everything that you did wrong. Um, and so in Virginia, we have people who do that during the degree as well. Well, I can't help you there. Uh, but if you can realize that, hey, I need to be the one who's at least willing to get out on the floor. If you already are somebody who realizes that sitting on the sidelines is not the way to actually progress the craft or to improve ourselves as, as brethren, if you can help yourself get past the hurdle of the, the intimidation of providing some sort of education, I, I like what you said, Jason. I think it's a, a good way to pick up one of these short talk bulletins. And if all you do is read it, then, hey, it gets something going and gets your comfort level down. People get to 
the idea of seeing you stand up and speak. And then after uh, maybe a month or two, uh, now you're not holding a short talk bulletin. You're holding something you printed out because you typed it. And and I think that might might be a way to help get them into it. Yeah, when uh, I was... Uh... And when I was preparing to be Worshipful Master, my mentor, David Hill, came to me and asked me to be a lodge education officer. I said, OK, under one condition, you will give an educational program at every single state of next year. It doesn't have to be long. I'd actually prefer it to be short, no more than five minutes. It doesn't have to be something you've written. But these brethren in this lodge will come out of lodge just a little bit wiser for it every single meeting. And if you do that for me, you've got the job. And he did it, and he did an amazing job. That's all you need to have for Masonic education. It doesn't have to be huge and grandiose. It can be just something small. And if you just have one or two brethren in there that think about something a certain way or, or a different way than they did before, then you've done your job. Now, in the few minutes we've got left, I do want to open it up a bit and uh... – and rather than ask you a specific question that, that, that you've been so happily answering up to this point, maybe there's a question I haven't thought to ask. Uh, so maybe you have some advice to give that I haven't asked a question, so you haven't had a chance to, uh, to relay it. But surely there is something that maybe we need to make sure brethren are thinking about. One thing that comes to my mind is, well, while you're standing there in lodge reading the short talk bulletin or reading whatever it is that you're presenting, um, maybe everybody's cordial and following parliamentary procedures, so to speak. But after the lodge, it would seem to me that I personally would feel a little intimidated. If now I'm going to have three, four, five brethren walk up to me and say, hey, tell me more about that. Hey, where did you get this source? Hey, hey, what did you do that? So I don't know if that's a common thing that you experience or what other kind of advice you could offer someone. So First and foremost, be comfortable with saying, you know what, I don't know. Hey, you know what, I did a lot of research on this particular topic, but I'm still kind of new to this. I'm still I'm still learning about it, so I don't have an answer to that question. Um, I can try to look it up and try to get back to you, though. That's uh, that's why I use um, all the time when I when I do briefings for my job. It's like, sir, I don't have that answer for you, but I'll get back to you on it. There is no shame in doing that. You do not have to know everything and you shouldn't know everything um, because if you think you know ever, everything, you're probably you know, coming off the wrong way to your brother. <laughs> when it comes to Masonic education, I had a, I had a great thought and it's just like gone. Um, <laughs> but it's St. Patrick's Day and, and Saturday night. Um, the best thing that uh, that you can do if if you want to get more Masonic education is to to be that person who's willing to step up and give your brethren that Masonic education. And if your master isn't interested in it, you know, okay, go to the neighboring lodge, ask around, um, look for look for ways that you can insert Masonic education into the lives of the Masons around you. All right, thoughts back. Masonic education does not mean only appropriate for a tiled lodge. I want to make sure people are critically aware of that. The quality of Masonic education is not tied to whether or not that program can only be given within a tiled lodge. I strive to make all of my programs open to everybody. Um, you take a look at the Masonic Roundtable. What is a Mason? We are on YouTube. We don't talk about any Masonic secrets or any specifics that would need to be conveyed in a tiled lodge. And that's okay. There are some great tiled programs. Brother Dave Bacon, who's a tattoo artist out of um, Cambridge, Ohio, came to my lodge and did an hour and a half long tiled lesson on symbolic interpretation and it was one of the most incredible programs i have ever seen um but that quality wasn't necessarily specifically because he talked about the super cool stuff that we can only talk about within lodge so so don't think that you have to find some way um to give a presentation even though you can't write it down um and you can't really go over it because you're not in the tiled lodge you know just 
start fresh and uh, and you'll be good to go. Well, that's awesome, man. I really do appreciate you coming on. I promised I would only hold you for a half an hour. So <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to unchain you from the desk and let you go. Uh, but as you are familiar with over on the round table, it seems like a good way to close out. Uh, final thoughts and shameless plugs. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> Well, oh, thanks so much, Jared. Thanks so much for for having me on. It's it's an honor to be here with you tonight. Um, I love coming on to to shows like this and and doing this. Um, and I'm a huge fan of of what you do. You do some incredible videos. I'm just so happy that uh, that you're actually doing this as an audio podcast as well. And so, if you're watching this video and you've got time in your car, or you uh, are finding that you can't devote a lot of time to looking at Masonic videos, you can go to iTunes and you can uh, download both Masonic Roundtable and What is a Mason, and you can listen to those on your commute. And that's a, that's a great way to get your fill of Masonic education before and after work each day. Uh, come check us out at the masonicroundtable.com. We go live every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. And if you're interested in... Um, and having me come speak either by Skype or coming to your lodge, feel free to uh, to look me up. Uh, my website is jasonmrichards.com, and you can uh, you can find me there. You can also uh, email me at the Masonic Roundtable at gmail.com or look me up on the Masonic Roundtable. Um, Masonic education is so incredibly important, especially in today's fraternity, uh, that you'll find that brethren will bend over backwards to be able to give a Masonic educational program or contribute to Masonic education. So if you're looking for speakers, um, ask. Just, you know, email a brother, you know, Facebook message a brother and say, hey, what would I need to do in order to get you to come to my lodge? Uh, I'm going to be going out with the rest of the guys from the Masonic Roundtable to Kentucky for an all-day Masonic educational symposium that we're putting together. Uh, it'll be May 19th. It's going to be awesome. And the gentleman who's uh, who's putting this together has been saying, people are asking me, like, how did you get those guys to come out? And he just said, I asked them, and they were happy to do so. So if you're looking for speakers, you know, you know you're going to get a different answer from each one, but... Don't be afraid to just reach out and say, "Hey, would you, would you be at all interested in coming? Like, we'd we'd love to have you." That's you know, folks who are who are going on the speaking circuit for masonry aren't doing it because they're making a lot of money. Uh, it's they're doing it because they believe in Masonic education, they believe in this fraternity, and they believe what you're doing in your lodge matters. So take advantage of that. Well, that's awesome. Uh, thanks again, Jason, uh, for coming on tonight and uh, for all the kind words. And I certainly feel like we could go for another two or three half hour episodes if we wanted <laughs> to. So maybe we'll schedule that sometime off in the future. But uh, for my shameless plug, uh, as Jason says, please uh, subscribe to this channel, What is a Mason on YouTube. But also, if you'd like to have it in an audio format, uh, you can find that on iTunes or even in Google Play if you prefer to use the Android devices. Or if you want to just download all of them, you can head over to whatisamason.org and look at it there. I also want to mention, uh, I think most of you would have seen the video uh, where I said to pay it forward. I've got that hand-painted apron that Brother Dave Bacon, who Jason was speaking about, did. And it's a, a painting of the bicentennial logo for 200 years of Freemasonry in the state of Mississippi. Now, even if you're not a Mississippi Mason, that's okay. The important part is this is a fundraiser for the scholarship fund for the Grand Lodge. So every year, the Grand Lodge of Mississippi issues out uh, $29,000 worth of college scholarships. And I want to ensure that that stays well endowed and uh, try to provide a little bit more funding to that scholarship and make sure that education is a priority here in Mississippi, whether we're talking about Masonic education or general education for uh, people just getting out of high school. So thank you all so much for taking the time to watch tonight. I really did appreciate it. One last thank you, Brother Jason, for coming out, and we will see all of you next time. Bye. <laughs>